Although colorism has been an ongoing issue, it's important to acknowledge who is responsible as well as who continues to instigate and indoctrinate in order to keep this issue an issue. In order for colonizers to keep us colonized, they need us fighting with each other and not them. Although I do acknowledge that some white people have been extremely mentally programmed to be hateful and racist towards those of a darker skin tone, I must also acknowledge that throughout history, there has always been white white people who have stood with and fought for people of color, white people fighting against white supremacy. Before we get into it, let's first break down the term people of color. Although we've been programmed to think that black people are a separate group from people of color, this is simply a divide and conquer tactic used by colonizers to keep us divided. When we're divided into little groups, there is no collective loyalty, so it's easier for them to remain in control. But in reality, the term people of color includes native Natives, African, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Middle Eastern, and people that are multiracial. More specifically, this group is actually referred to as people of the global majority. With this knowledge, it is clear now why they want to keep us divided. To not do so would prove to be obvious that we are in fact the majority and we outnumber them. Now that we're clear on who and what people of color really are, let's talk about the white people that have fought against the injustices of people of color. Sarah Moore Grimke and Angelina Emily Grimke were known as the Grimke sisters and they were advocates for women's rights and the abolition of slavery. They grew up in a family that owned slaves in South Carolina. They grew to despise slavery, so they ended up moving to the North in the 1820s. They then became part of the Quaker community they became deeply involved with the abolition movement and they began traveling and giving lectures. They gave their firsthand experience with slavery on their parents' plantation and they spoke out against the cruelty and injustices that they witnessed. They were often ridiculed, but that did not stop them. They went on to become two of the first white women to speak out publicly in social reform movements. Angelina, who was particularly outspoken, wrote an appeal letter to the Christian women of the South. She was called for white women to support and embrace the anti-slavery movement. She wrote in her letter, I know you don't make the laws, but you are the wives, mothers, sisters, and daughters of those who do. And if you really suppose that you can do nothing to overthrow slavery, you are greatly mistaken. The sisters traveled all over the Northeast and gave speeches on abolishing slavery. Their perspectives were highly valued because of the fact that they had grown up in a slave owning household. And they therefore understood the system more than other Northern abolitionists. William Lloyd Garrison was a white abolitionist, suffragist, social reformer, and journalist. He was best known for his popular newspaper, The Liberator. The paper published an article by Angelina Grimsky about abolishing slavery. The Liberator was founded in 1831 and it was published every single week in Boston until slavery was abolished in the US in 1865. He was also one of the founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society. He emphasized the need for the immediate abolishing of slavery as opposed to the gradual abolishing of slavery. Slavery. This was despite the threats, financial struggles, and the violence that he faced as a result. Still, he continued to fight for emancipation. He worked with activists such as Charles Lennox and Frederick Douglass. Andrew Goodman and Michael Schumer were white American civil rights activists. They took part in the Freedom Summer campaign to register African Americans to vote. There they met social activist James Cheney. They all worked together on this campaign in Mississippi. Trumer was designated as the head of the field office, but on their first day, the three men were pulled over for allegedly speeding. After being released, they were then handed over to the KKK and then they were shot and killed. The Mississippi State Sovereign Commission was extremely opposed to integration. They paid spies to identify citizens that were suspected of activism. They were eventually implicated in the murders. 
Hazel Bryan Massery is known for appearing in an iconic photo of the Little Rock Nine. The Little Rock Nine were nine African-American students that attended an all-white high school. Hazel was seen leering at the Little Rock Nine in the photo. And although she was only 15 years old, the photo continued to haunt her later on in life. She tracked down Elizabeth Eckford, one of the Little Rock Nine students, and called her up to apologize for what she did. They ended up forming a long-lasting friendship. Still, Hazel never stopped thinking of that photo, and she lived her life making amends for it. She went on to teach mothering skills to single African-American mothers, and she took underprivileged African-American children on productive outings. On several occasions, she even defended African-Americans to her racist family members. Members. Hazel had changed on the inside, but to this day, she is known as the little racist white girl in the photo. Anne McCarty Braden. She was a journalist and community organizer for Louisville, Kentucky. She defied racist real estate practices and organized white Southerners to support the civil rights movement. She rejected a segregationist privileged past. In 1950, she helped an African-American couple purchase a home in an all-white neighborhood in Kentucky. She was indicted on charges of sedition. She became an advocate for racial and economic equality. She received praise for her efforts from Martin Luther King Jr. Braden's activism lasted for nearly six decades, making her one of the most dedicated white voices to speak out against racism in the United States. John Brown was an abolitionist that worked with the Underground Railroad. As a young kid, John Brown witnessed a young slave boy being beaten, and this haunted him for years to come. It motivated him to dedicate his life to abolishing slavery. Brown believed that in order to truly abolish slavery, there would need to be violence. So when the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 was passed, there was conflict on whether or not Kansas would be a free state. In 1856, John and several of his men got together and killed five pro-slavery settlers. With the intent of inspiring a slave revolt, John led an unsuccessful raid on the Harper's Ferry Federal Army. He held dozens of men hostage and it lasted for two days. They were then defeated by military forces led by Robert Lee. Many of his men were killed, including his two sons. John was captured, tried, and then executed on December 2nd, 1859. Joan Mulholland. She was a white teenager in the South that put her life on the line during the civil rights movements. She attended many demonstrations and sit-ins, and she was one of the Freedom Riders in 1961 that was arrested and put on death row for months. She was the first white American to join in the Woolworths lunch counter sit-in in 1963. She also participated in the march in Washington, D.C. with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as well as the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. She was quoted saying, anyone can make a difference. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. Find a problem, get some friends together, and go fix it. You don't have to change the world, just change your world. Fred Rogers from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood he was a TV personality, puppeteer, musician, a writer, a producer, and a minister. He created Mr. Rogers Neighborhood and it ran from 1968 to 2001. Mr. Rogers' intent was to create a show that repaired inequality. He ensured that the cast and the audience for the show consisted of all races, and he wanted it to appeal to all children. The show's popular song, Won't You Be My Neighbor, has a powerful message of equality as well. Laura Town was an American abolitionist and educator. She formed the first schools for newly freed slaves. Laura was raised in Philadelphia and she attended many sermons about abolishing slavery. She was deeply inspired by those sermons and her and her Quaker friend, Ellen Murray, founded the Penn Center on St. Helena Island. 
This was the first school for newly freed slaves. James Tyson collaborated with Bree Newsom to have the Confederate flag removed from the South Carolina State House on June 27, 2015. The two activists that just met a few days prior went to the flagpole and Tyson braced himself so that Newsom, who was strapped to climbing gear, could use his leg to jump the four foot fence. Tyson stood quietly at the bottom of the pole while she climbed. He remained quietly in the background and that should always be the plan for any white allies to show support without dominating. After removing the flag, the two were arrested, but the state voted to remove the flag permanently three weeks later. These are only 10 out of many times that white people have fought against the injustices of people of color. It's important to understand that race is not a scientific category, but instead a cultural invention by European colonizers who were seeking to colonize and exploit other regions and its inhabitants. So they wanted to differentiate themselves from the populations that they wished to subjugate. The horrendous stories of racism against Africans can also be told for other people of color, like the Indians who were subjected to mass genocide, and the Chinese who were often targeted with mob terror and banned altogether from immigrating in 1882, the Japanese who were thrown into prison-like caps during World War II, and other groups who were later accepted as white the Irish, Italians, and Jews, who were also met with discrimination, hostility, and mob violence. Civil rights laws was a great step towards bettering humanity, but it didn't end racism. Overt white racism had a profound impact on the hearts and the minds of people of color and white people, who have all internalized racist narratives and stereotypes about other groups and themselves leading to a false narrative. It's so bad that people of color with lighter skin tones are seen as more privileged than those with darker skin tones, even in their own communities. Systemic racism is still very much prevalent today. And if we don't start changing the way that we think and opening up our minds, we will continue to remain in this organized insanity.